I'm commenting on a podcast I recently viewed that I really, really sat with me. You know, it was a Joe Rogan podcast and it featured Cornel West. And it had to be, if not my favorite Joe Rogan podcast, but it was a special moment, I think, when you have one of the greatest minds of our generation on a show that does have a variety of guests from, you know, Joe Rogan has a lot of fighting, a lot of, uh, you know, UFC fighters on, politicians. Most of the, pol the political views are usually probably from the right. So having Cornel West on was a brilliant move because I think Cornel West explained a lot of dynamics that are rarely explained from the standpoint of a worldview and someone whose mind is so amazing. And so in America, when we talk about politics, we talk about race, you rarely have an expert who has the, uh, the depth and authority and the command of history to fairly explain uh, political concepts and ideas. And Cornel West did that. And so I wanted to break this down, uh, playing back some of the interview, because I really was amazed. I learned, I, I jotted down a lot of the books that he recommended. So like I said, he talked about politics. He talked about race. He talked about the American dream. So I think those are the three things we'll focus on. Politics, race, the American dream. First, politics. Uh, they dealt with democratic socialism, you know, uh, the Republicans are trying to make socialism a bad word. They're trying to brand the progressive Democrats as socialists and then therefore saying, well, socialist is bad. Socialism is bad versus capitalism. Uh, Cornel West did a great job of breaking down what does democratic socialism mean. Check it out. The Pledge of Allegiance was written by Francis Bellamy, who was a socialist. The song American the Beautiful, which is one of the most beautiful songs. Ray Charles sang that song and take you to a different place. Mm. I mean, he's seeing things that we can't see and you know he's blind. <laughs> you know what I mean? America the Beautiful. Yes. Elizabeth Lee Bates, socialist, Professor uh. Wellesley, who was our greatest poet, Walt Whitman, deep ties to socialism. Who was our greatest philosopher, John Dewey, Democratic Socialist his whole life. Helen Keller, deaf, mute, blind, graduate of Radcliffe, socialist. Mm. Ryan Hole Niebuhr, the greatest Christian thinker of the 20th century. Democratic Socialist, moral man in the moral society. Martin Luther King Jr., Democratic Socialist. Ella Baker, Democrat. Democratic Socialism is as American as apple pie. But with the communists and the communist threat and the Soviet Union and all of its repression and regimentation and violation of liberties and killing of the kulaks and so forth, in the American mind, socialism becomes associated with communism. Mm -hmm. And so you saw Brother Lindsay the other day, right? Yes. He looked like a cartoonist version of, of, of Joseph McCarthy. They're all communists. They're all communists. And you see, what happens is in a neo-fascist discourse, it's true anywhere around the world. If you can define a community as pure and then characterize those on the outside who are threatening as impure and then view yourself as those coming to the rescue to preserve the purity, it can be based on race, it can be based on religion, it can be based on politics, preserve that purity. We saw it in the 50s with the hysteria. Mm -hmm. The communists were what? Smith Act. They're deported. Or they're taken to jail. I mean, the first, the first city councilman from Harlem, Benjamin Davis, went to jail because he was a communist, you see, because they were the impure. Mm. You see. Now, communism needs to be radically called into question in terms of its dominating forms, like the Soviet Union and China on the mile and so forth and so on. 
But at the same time, when you look at Karl Marx and his critique of capitalism, he, this is prior to Lenin, prior to Stalin, prior, he says capitalism is tied to this obsession with profit that puts profit before people mm. and it will generate oligopolies in which there will be grotesque levels of wealth inequality and the only way that poor and working people will be able to gain access to any resources is through organizing and mobilizing. Now, you can accept that Marxist insight without being a Marxist. He's just telling the truth. So, do you think that... Secondly, we talk about race. I guess what I, what I mean by race is white supremacy, the origins of white supremacy. Why is such a huge player in the United States and the world? He did an amazing job of breaking that down. Check this out. Too often in monolithic categories. There's never been a white supremacy without fighting against white supremacy, and that includes white brothers and sisters. There's a tradition from Ann Braden, from Miles Horton, you know, of Highlander Center. You got that wonderful picture of Rosa Parks. She was at Highlander Center four months before she was arrested, before she sat down on a bus in order to stand up for justice. Right there at Highlander Center under Miles Horton. Who was Miles Horton? A white brother who brought black folk and white folk together, went to Union Seminary, trained under Ryan Hole Niebuhr. He had cousins in the Ku Klux Klan. Wow. So his Thanksgiving dinners were very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but that's true for a whole lot of white brothers and sisters <laughs> who fight against white supremacy. Yeah. And Braden, uh, 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 Rabbi Abraham Joshua, Heschel, Edward Zaid. You have a whole tradition of white brothers and sisters who've been fighting against white supremacy. You get it in the music. Beck Spiderbeck, he's sitting at the feet of Louis Armstrong, and he's a great artist. Louis is genius of geniuses, right? And that middle-class brother from Iowa, you ask him about white supremacy. You ask Brubeck about white supremacy. You ask any of the, uh, uh, Paul Desmond, all of these folk who are connected to traditions in which black humanity, brown humanity is seen and affirmed. Never thought about that before. No, what I mean, you've got these scholars of American studies. Uh, um, I mean, Nail Payne is one of the towering ones, but it goes all the way back to Brother Alexander and, and David, David Rodinger and some others who've been talking about the way in which whiteness was created. Take, for example, an Irish brother who goes to Ellis Island. His people have been dealing with 800 years of vicious British colonialism and imperialism, vicious attacks, mm -hmm. various famines that were in some ways created or at least enabled and so on. They get to New York and they're told that they're white. And they say, no, no, because we know the British are white and we're not British. Right. At all. At all. But then they say, yes, you are. Look at Brother West. Look at Jamal. Look at Letitia. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to go on the Jim Crow bus when you just get <laughs> off the boat from Ireland? Right. If you go to the front, you with vanilla folk. <laughs> you go to the back, you with the chocolate folk. What you going to do? And for our precious Jewish brothers and sisters, it was even more complicated. More complicated, right? Because they get there and they say, no, we're not with the Goy and we're not with the Gentiles. Y'all been oppressing us for 2,000 years. Pogroms, ghettos. Holocaust, vicious attacks, and so on. But then they get there and say, well, are we going to be in the back with the black folk? Some of them did. You see, because you got a rich yeah. tradition of progressive Jews. You see, Noam Chomsky would have got back there. Stanley Aronowitz would have got back there with the black folk. You see what I mean? But you got some other Jewish folk, like any other group. Well, we kind of lukewarm. Let's just kind of move back and forth. And then some of them want to assimilate completely, especially the highbrow German Jews. We're actually white as well as the Gentiles. You're mm. in America now. Get beyond that old world prejudice. Mm. You say, well, you better check yourself because every Christian civilization we know is shot through with Jewish hatred. Mm. Don't, don't believe the hype. Sooner or later, it's going to be manifest. You see what I mean? And so in that way, you can see the, the discourse of whiteness, blackness, brownness, redness, and so forth becomes so, so deeply rooted in American law, American structures, American perceptions, and this is why the arts are so crucial because it's primarily in the music and in the arts where the breakdown of white supremacy begins to take place in the country. And then this was my favorite because I think this speaks to the meaning of life, why we are here. He talks about the American dream, 
the American dream and what aspect of the American dream uh, are we missing? And this is our humanity. Check this out. No, it's it, that's that's part of the uh, so part part of the problem. The American dream it doesn't go far enough. The mm. American the American dream says, "I'm going to work hard, sacrifice, and get mine, and live large in some vanilla suburb, maybe with a trophy spouse, and feel good <laughs> about myself." You yeah. say nothing wrong with wanting to gain access to resources. Nothing wrong with working hard. Nothing wrong with living where you want to live. But then the question becomes: Now you're successful. But you're not great. Greatness has to do with he or she who uses their success for something bigger than them. Mm -hmm. Service to others, service to the least of these. So that the great ones, like the Richard Pryors, you see, not a matter of how much money he made. It's a matter of his soul in his comedy and the love that he left in his legacy. Martin Luther King Jr. died, basically a broke man. Gave every penny that he won from the Nobel Prize to the movement. Malcolm X only only had $150 in his pocket. Who cares about the richest black person in 1968 and 1965? That's ephemera. We're talking about deep joy, deep love. We will remember those who raised their voices and said, in the name of something bigger than my ego and my narcissism and my hedonism. And we all have it. We all have it. So, you know, we have to always be self-critical in that regard. We all fall short. You know, the great Samuel Beckett, number great, another great comic writer. Try again, fail again, fail better. <laughs> That's the story of our lives. Yeah. Try again, fail again, fail better. But even in failing better, we can at least raise our voices. But within the black community, the top 1% of black folk have over 70% of the wealth. So that means you got a lot of precious Jamals and Letitias out there who, don't, or, who are told to live vicariously through the lives of black celebrities. Mm. So it's all about representation rather than substantive transformation. You get that in politicians, you know. You got a black president, all of y'all must be free. Isn't mm. that a beautiful thing? Live through him, mm. live through the family. Beautiful achievement, magnificent achievement. But it's not about symbolic representation only. This is about fundamental transformation. So it's a challenge. Mary Ellen Pleasant and others, and Martin King and others, are challenges for those of us who do have some resources to still raise our voices. Because you can be black, highly well adjusted to injustice, economically, in terms of race and so forth, you see. And the same is true. You can be brown. You can be red. So it's not just a matter of looking for that one individual who represents. It's a matter of connecting that representation to fundamental transformation. If there's no fundamental transformation, you end up with a whole generation of peacocks. Mm. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. All about foliage. And what does that do? That falls directly into the culture of superficial spectacle. Yeah. Last thing we need is just spectacle with no substance mm. in that way. So like I said, I think this was not only the best Joe Rogan podcast I ever witnessed, it probably was one of my favorite moments on social media that I've ever witnessed because you had uh, a Cornel West, uh, in a sense, all to ourselves to uh, explain um very complex concepts that we all have opinions on, but most of us aren't well read enough and haven't lived life enough to truly understand, experience, and definitely explain um, these things. So I thank uh, Joe Rogan for having Cornel West on. Thank you, Cornel West. I look forward to getting a shot. But that was such an amazing interview. I don't know what's left, but man, man, hats off to uh, Joe Rogan and Cornel West. Thank you for watching this. Share it, like it, download the Allison and Mark app. It's A-L-L-I-S-O-N, the and sign, M-A-R-C app. You'll find all my stuff there, Allison and Mark. And you can listen to me and my wife as we do an afternoon show on radio station WHUR in Washington, D.C., 3 to 7 p.m. It's afternoons with Allison and Mark. Check it out and also download the WHUR app. Oh, there's a lot going on. Thank you again for watching this. Be good. Peace.